Hey there, my name is AJ Pickett and I make videos about role-playing games. You can join this channel to show your support. I'm also on Subscribestar and Patreon for those who like the full scripts I write for these videos. Please do hit that like button and subscribe if you would be so kind. Today we return to a classic dungeon environment. Walking softly through the dark spaces, not bothering with torches as everyone seems to have dark vision these days, we spot a welcome yet suspicious sight. A perfectly ordinary room with an orderly arrangement of granite flagstones, just like the last few we've checked, but right in the middle of the room is a once sturdy iron-bound oak wood chest, still locked with what looks like a brass padlock, but there seems to be severe rust to the hinges, and the wood is so warped with age we can see gaps, and inside, a rich haul of coins. But wait a moment, if something's too good to be true, it usually isn't, so we take a half minute to rummage in my backpack, and take out a number of small metal rods that can be screwed together, each of them hollow and containing a special tip for different functions. This is the infamous halfling segmented pole I've been carrying in my adventures for years. I picked it up in Lurin off a trader from Astagund. Selecting the blade end, I screw it in place, affix the blade like a bayonet, and extend my 10 foot metal pole out to prod that locked chest as hard as I can. Sure enough, that chest is not made out of wood, but that is no mimic. As soon as I feel the blade connect with what feels and sounds like rock, I turn and immediately make a dive for the doorway back out of this room, and just in the nick of time. The flagstones of the floor seem to explode beneath me. My feet get solidly clipped and I roll with as much grace as a gelatinous cube out into the hallway, while back inside that room, the huge flat body of the trapper slams together, folded up around the fake protrusion in its middle. Stunned silence, brandished weapons and wide eyes staring back into the room, our adventuring party now sees that the true floor of this deadly chamber is broken with soggy and dark moss and fungus, with clusters of it covering the many skeletons of adventurers and dungeon denizens who did not manage to avoid the deadly embrace of the trapper. Trappers are rare, solitary carnivores that can be related, may be related, to the lurker above, which I'll talk about more in the later stages of this video. Trappers are creatures who originally had a resemblance to air-breathing manta rays with no tails, grotesquely flattened out with a body made of lean muscle and grisly flesh covered in dense, very leathery membranes. But at some point, this species heightened their chameleon concealment abilities to the actual act of shape-shifting. Trappers are restricted to the ground due to their large size. Adults reach between 400 and 600 square feet. Their upward-facing hide is very tough, dense flesh, and a surface with a rocky texture, as gritty as grade 50 sandpaper. Volo's Guide to Monsters tells us that a trapper can alter the colour and texture of its outer side to match its surroundings. It can blend in with any surface made of stone, earth, or wood masking its presence to any but the most suspicious adventurers. It can't change its texture to that of grassy or snow-covered surfaces, but it can change its colour to match and then conceal itself under a thin layer of vegetation or actual snow. They have the ability to form a central hump of body mass and form the physical appearance of some dungeon loot. Most of the time it will emulate the fresh remains of some dungeon or cave-dwelling creature, luring in other predators and vermin for it to snap up, crush, constrict and smother to death slowly digesting them over the course of eight hours, sizzling in acid excretions over the course of that time until all flesh is stripped away and the trapper stashes the bones and such underneath it with the rest of the trash. Trappers have a pretty good appetite and need to eat about 30 pounds of meat every day. This includes a lot of rodents, loads of insects, small slimes and mobile fungus, free roaming scavengers all the way up to adventuring humanoids and it's them who have well, it's not escaped the average adventurers notice that 30 pounds of meat is roughly the size of a halfling. So they'll refer to a trapper eating at least a halfling a day. Something that bothers halflings somewhat. The trapper will position themselves into an ideal hunting position, somewhere with a lot of traffic, or sniff out a suitable space to fit their whole body and set up an ambush. If trappers don't have an adequate food supply to support reproducing offspring, they'll go into a state of hibernation that can last for months. If they have fed well for a while beforehand, this hibernation is more like a trance than a sleep state. They remain aware of when prey comes near and can spring into life even after weeks spent motionless. 
A trapper on the verge of starvation might defy its instincts and begin creeping along, abandoning its old territory in search of better hunting. They move about as fast as a speeding sloth at a rate of 10 feet per round, and they move with their whole body slithering along It provides them with an automatic climb speed of 10 feet as well. Their false appearance snaps in the moment they become motionless. It requires a DC 20 investigation or nature skill check to discern their presence, while those who know the trapper just moved into that position just have to beat the trapper's plus two stealth skill. Otherwise, the things just blend right in really fast. In 5th edition, they have a natural armor class of 13 and between 40 and 130 with an average of 85 hit points. Trappers have excellent short range sensors, giving them blind sight to 30 feet and dark vision out to 60 feet. They have a strength of 17 with average dexterity and are dumb as a bag of rocks. They attack by smothering. One larger or smaller creature within 5 feet of the trapper must succeed on a DC 14 dexterity saving throw or be grappled. Escape DC is also 14. Until the grapple ends, the target takes 46 plus 3 bludgeoning damage plus 1d6 acid damage at the start of each of its turns. While grappled in this way, the target is restrained, blinded, and at risk of suffocation. The trapper can smother only one creature at a time, however. From earlier editions, we learned that the trapper was once commonly immune to heat and cold-based attacks. You may decide that that is a subbreed of rarer trapper that you can encounter. They lay clusters of pebble-like eggs, which hatch into offspring that look like flat rocks, which makes these offspring ideal for lurking at the edge of a pit, a chasm, a noxious pool, or a giant spiderweb, and simply latching onto an adventurer's boot for a moment, toppling them to their potential death and eating the remains afterwards. I see nothing wrong with having a immature trapper as a found familiar. Trappers live for about a decade and a very skilled leather crafter can fashion a suit of non-magical plus one leather armor from trapper hide. Trapper meat, once the rind of leather is cut off, can be salt cured like bacon, but it's stark white, normally cooked and seasoned to a deep red and very spicy. Trapper chaw is made from bits of pickled trapper rind and keep the teeth clean and make for a gritty and very sour chewing snack that only dwarves can really appreciate. The trapper's digestive organs are a squishy horror show and don't store any gems or other such valuables inside themselves. The trappers may be closely related to the lurker above species which also hunts by stealth, constriction and smothering, dropping onto victims from above or snaring them from the walls. Lurker aboves are able to float in the air for a little while in order to get up to the ceiling of a dungeon or a cave. They're almost always found in a dungeon or cavern or in the Underdark. They can also be found in many of the other planes of existence, such as the Shadowfell, the Elemental Plane of Earth, Feywild, and even the Howling Depths of Pandemonium. There are few spaces that this lurking and hardy species can't scratch out some sort of survival. The lurker above females lay eggs in glutinous clutches adhered to the ceiling in sticky messes, which hatch into flat little slabs that look like moss. The juveniles can't float at first, but grow to adult size and develop gas sacs inside their flesh, which makes their body lighter than air when inflated with their digestive gases. I imagine that it doesn't smell very fresh when they deflate their flight sacs and settle into their ambush position. The sacs can be harvested from the lurker above, from a dead one at least, if the gases inside are contained they can fetch a high price as the gases are used in creations of potions of levitation. The eggs of the lurkers and trappers sell for around 900 gold coins each, young lurkers and trappers sell for about 1100 gold pieces, but only when they are hatchling sized, buyers are wary of buying them too big as they are dangerous and get much harder to manage, so the price always goes down the bigger the trapper or lurker above is. Both species have another relative, much more like the trapper than the lurker above in its hunting style, but not a shapeshifter. The forest trapper hunts by ground ambush. It is also equipped with twig-like poisonous barbs that flick up all over its back that it extends up from beneath the forest floor. This poison requires a DC 14 constitution saving throw or the victim becomes paralyzed. The toxin can be harvested from the tiny sacks located at the base of each barb. The forest trapper has more of that manta ray shape and its body has a tough bony ridge that runs along its front end and also the dorsal line. The rest of its hide is mottled a pattern of browns and greeny browns. 
Even living on the surface world in Deep Forest, the Forest Trapper, which many know as miners, constantly burrow just under the surface, feeding on all sorts of other burrowing creatures, but also spiking and swallowing up plenty of surface creatures as well. Whether or not they are actually related, the species of intelligent air-breathing cave manta rays, the cloakers, tend to keep trappers and lurker aboves around like pets and guard dogs. It just may be that the cloakers find the origins of these creatures and their physical resemblance to be pleasing, while their predatory habits are just an added convenience, so they're more like pets. Remember, if you like to learn all about fantastic, classic and weird creatures of Dungeons and Dragons like this one each week, hit that subscribe button for me, I very much appreciate it. I'm also told I have a voice that can knock out a sleepy person from close range, and I'm better for a long car ride than smooth jazz and a cup of warm tea. I currently am running a Kickstarter, link to that is down below, it's actually quite topical for today's creature being a large dungeon surface. Backers of the Kickstarter will get themselves a super high quality space age silicon gaming mat, hex grid printed on one side and a square grid printed on the other, it's an A1 paper sized. Uh, never creases or wrinkles, never scuffs, and is the most perfect dry erase surface you can buy. It will even take dark permanent markers just and be touch dry and smudge resistant in seconds, and you can just wipe that away with a damp cloth. Included in the Kickstarter package is also a large canvas carry bag for your silicon sheets and all your gaming gear. Plenty of room for all that stuff. And I've also designed the silicon character sheet for those games where you have to make temporary changes to your character stats, note conditions, effects, uh, their most common bonuses for skills, attacks and such, spell lists, loot, equipment, ammunition, character goals, alternate forms for their druid self, you name it, the spaces are just suggestive but undefined, suitable for every gaming system that actually needs some sort of a character sheet. Also included is a nifty little strip of silicon printed with my combat tracker. This includes a line of numbers 1 to 20 to track initiative order and round by round events and effects. Plus there's a little 6 by 10 inch square tactical grid at the bottom of these for games on video chat where it's just faster to work out where your character is moving and flash the map up over the camera. It can also be used uh, for note taking as an area that can be used for hit locations, solving puzzles, plus tons of other users I've not figured out because gamers are very creative bunches of people and will no doubt come up with many uses that I've never even thought of. Up the top of the combat tracker is another box, a um, pair of row of boxes for tracking ammunition, rounds passed, spell slots, sanity points, body counts, you name it. The Kickstarter is live now, it runs for 60 days, the kits of the bag and the sheets take about 30 days to manufacture so uh, and get out to backers, so once we get the uh, goal, Hopefully, backers will have their gear in their hands before July, and we can get some gaming conventions and home games started up again in earnest. Plus, all those folks like me who game from home via video chats, I found all the silicon sheets really handy. I'm not knocking Roll20 and Fantasy Grounds and Astral and other social gaming platforms, I'm just, I like drawing maps and taking notes by hand. Sharing that over a camera still in parts that sit at home, feel around the dinner table, and you get to make use of all your minis and other terrain that you make. I love miniature crafting, it's how I got into the YouTube videos in the first place. I started talking about monster ecologies and tactics around six years ago when I was crafting a Roper miniature for my D&D games, and also because I like making tiny terrain and creatures. It's a hobby which perfectly feeds into my other hobby. Along with all those thousands of hours happily sculpting minis came many hours pondering what's the best gaming surface. Silicon is environmentally friendly, non-toxic, has a very low atmospheric carbon profile, won't wear out, so ever so you don't need to put it into a landfill if it never actually wears out you can use this for generations and be able to hand it down to your next bunch of gamers i have tested this material at high temperatures including actually cooking a pizza on a map and dry erasing the baked inks merely moments after i ate the hot and delicious pizza i never knew that science could be so tasty no gaming mat compares. You can scrunch the silicon mat into a ball for transport and storage. Every time you put it down on the table, it rolls perfectly flat and smooth. Food and drink spills just brush right off. Protects the table from metal dice rolls. Feels great. Looks great. Lasts a lifetime. Best price. Very much appreciated support for me and all that I do. Thank you if you do decide to invest your uh, money in the best gaming gear that money can buy. Thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon. Thank you.